Hello, everyone, and welcome to End of Life University podcast, where we share real talk about life and death. I'm your host, Dr. Karen Wyatt, and I want to thank you for being here with me today for episode number 335. In just a moment, I'll be sharing with you an interview I did with Megan Mooney about Death Cafe. And so whether you're familiar with Death Cafe or not, I think you'll find it interesting and informative. So stay tuned and listen to my conversation with Megan. Before we get there, I have an, an, a couple of announcements. First of all, coming up on January 30th of 2022 is the second annual Symposium on Death and Bereavement Studies. Terry Daniel is hosting it. I'm one of the speakers for this online event. And the theme is positive and negative religious coping. It's a really interesting topic. And she has lined up some great speakers. I'll be talking about when hope is harmful at the end of life. So you can come to the link in the show notes at eolupodcast.com. Look for episode 335. There will be a link where you can go to learn more about the event and also to register if you're interested in attending. So that's coming up very soon. And I'm really excited about it. I think it's going to be a great learning event. So it starts at 9 a.m. Pacific time, 12 noon Eastern time on Sunday, January 30th. So check out the link and I hope you can join us for that. Then I also want to extend a huge thank you to my two newest supporters on Patreon, S. Robertson and Debbie Weinstein, thank you for helping us get closer to that goal of being able to provide transcripts for every episode. We only need four more people to sign up as contributors on my page at patreon.com slash E-O-L-U, and we will have met the goal to be able to do transcripts for every episode. So thanks S. Robertson and Debbie Weinstein, and thanks to everyone else who've been making contributions all along for the last few years. I really appreciate it. And then one comment I wanted to share, some feedback I got from Jane, who let me know that she's been listening to older podcast episodes. There were four under a series called The Dance of Life and Death, Timing, Balance, Rhythm, and Grace. And Jane let me know she's been dealing with some end of life issues with her parents and she found these episodes very helpful to her and sustaining to her as she's going through a lot of challenges. So I want do want to remind you if you go to eolupodcast.com, you'll find all of the previous episodes there, the archives. You can scroll through. There's a ton of them because here we are on episode 335 today. So there's a lot to look through, but you might find content there that you find helpful to you that has been recorded even a few years ago. So with that being said, we will move on to the interview with Megan Mooney. And I wanted to mention, Megan has an article that came out in Newsweek online about Death Cafe. That's one of the things that inspired me to want to do an interview because I haven't talked about Death Cafe for quite a long time. So I will link to that Newsweek article also if you'd like to read that. And now we'll move on with the interview with Megan. Just remember to stay tuned after Afterward, I'll be back with a few takeaways and to say goodbye. So here we go. Today, I'm so happy to welcome my guest, Megan Mooney. Megan has worked in hospice and hospice research and is currently the director of social services for a long-term care center. She has been involved with Death Cafe since 2013. She runs a Death Cafe in St. Joseph, Missouri, is the Death Cafe lead for the U.S., and is in charge of the International Death Cafe Facebook page. And today, we're going to talk all about Death Cafe, and you can find out more about it at the website deathcafe.com. So Megan, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you so much for having me on. I realized that I haven't really talked about Death Cafe for quite a long time. The, the last thing I did about Death Cafe, I interviewed John Underwood back in 2015. Aww. So I thought this would be a good time to update people on Death Cafe and even to introduce it to people who may not have heard of it before. 
So I thought maybe to begin with, you could just explain to people what Death Cafe is or what is a Death Cafe. Well, Death Cafe um, is usually a pop-up event at a Death Cafe. People, usually strangers, come together and they to eat cake, drink tea or coffee and discuss death. So really um, anything that's on their mind related to death and dying. Our objective is to increase awareness of death while helping people make the most of their finite lives. A death cafe is a group directed discussion of death. So that means we do not have any agendas or themes. It's a discussion group rather than a led group or a grief support counseling session. Um, We found that people have enough on their mind as it comes to death and dying to talk about that they don't need anything else. And really there's nothing else out there like that. Really, when you have a death cafe, you just start with what brought you here tonight to want to talk about death. And that leads the whole conversation. You know, our death cafes are always offered on a not-for-profit basis, an accessible, respectful, and confidential space with no intention of leading people to any conclusion, product, or course of action. Um, We always want to provide drinks and food and And that's because we believe that people are more apt to talk about death if they have food because it's life-sustaining. We found that to be true. So that's really what a death cafe is. You can have one death cafe or you could have hundreds of them. You know, it's just up to the host. Some people will have them every month and have them at the same place. Some people prefer to liven it up and have it at different places. It's just up to them. And from the death cafes that I've participated in, Megan, I think it's, it's amazing that every single death cafe is different. There, there are never (laughs) any two that are alike because it all depends on who shows up and what they have to talk about. Absolutely. It's so interesting how they change in every single one. Yeah, so these conversations never get boring because it's amazing the stories that people have to share, the experiences people have, and the things they need to discuss. And um, at least when I've attended death cafes, it's always like kind of blown me away every time how people end up sharing and coming together and actually really helping each other. It seems like even though, I mean, that wasn't part of the agenda, but it just seems like as people talk openly, it helps everyone. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious, how did you become inspired in the beginning to work with Death Cafe? Because it's been a long time now since 2013. Well, and what you just said is exactly how I became involved. Um, In 2012, I was getting my master's degree um, and I was working in hospice and working in end of life research. And my uncle was diagnosed with cancer. And he was not told by his oncologist or any of his care team that he had terminal cancer. He was given all this false hope. And I kept getting called by my family and asked to help. And I finally figured out they had no clue what was going on. And so I went to the oncologist and got him to admit that he had lied to him. And he told me he was going to go tell him the truth. And he didn't. And my uncle died a really horrible death and he didn't have to, it was completely unnecessary and uh, it really angered me um, and made me start thinking, you know, I want to do something on a macro level to help people because I was working with hospice family caregivers to help people to get them together so that they can talk about these things and help educate each other and have these conversations that people aren't having. And uh, it just so happened that, Death Cafe had just started then, you know, um, had been brought to the U.S. by Lizzie Miles in 2012. And this was in 2012. And my boss had just read about it and she told me about it. And I was like, this sounds like exactly what I want to do. So I got a hold of Lizzie and um, she helped me. And I started mine. It was like February 2013, right when L.A. and New York and Atlanta and all the big cities were starting theirs. And, you know, I was a little town in St. Joseph, Missouri, starting mine, but it was really cool because I got to start with all of them and we came 
really, really close. I felt like a social worker, it was important to bring about social change. And I felt like the Death Cafe guidelines supported those principles. Are you yeah. still running the group the Sever- in St. Joseph? Yes, I do. Wow. So that's amazing. I just wanted to ask you, do the same people tend to come each time you hold it or is it different every time? You know, we have, I have a core group that always comes, which is amazing. And then I have new people every time too. And when I first started, it was so cool. I had these two ladies who would drive seven hours one way to come. Wow. Yeah. And it just, that would always, I would have been such awe, but that showed me how much needed these conversations were. Yeah, definitely. I remember the the death cafes that I attended and then some I hosted back in those days. It always felt to me like there was tremendous pent-up demand everywhere. Everywhere mm-hmm. I went, people need to talk about death. And there were always people there who it's as if they've been waiting for years to have someone they could talk yes. to about these things. Yeah, I remember I had this lady, she came and I actually knew her, but um, she was shaking at the beginning and uh, afterwards she came up and thanked me and she was probably in her 60s and she said she had never spoke about death her whole life because her family you know, taught her it was a taboo, you don't speak about it ever, you don't have that conversation and she'd always wanted to have it but It was so ingrained in her that you don't talk about it. So she was just shaking. I guess for me, I've grown up since a little kid, always talking about it is something that intrigued me. So that's something foreign to me that, you know, you wouldn't talk about it. But Death Cafe really does serve as a place to um, break that taboo for so many people and they really need it. Yeah, it's so true. And, you know, I mentioned John Underwood's name and I want to do honor to him because Mm -hmm. he started it in the very beginning. So would you tell our listeners a little bit about John's story and the very beginnings of Death Cafe, just so everyone understands how this whole idea came about? Yeah. So John Underwood is our founder of Death Cafe. In 2010, John decided to develop a series of projects about death And one was to focus talking about death. Um, In November of 2010, John had read about the work of Bernard Cartaz in the independent newspaper. He was inspired by his work and he decided to use a similar model for his own project and he called it Death Cafe. The first Death Cafe that was held in the UK was offered in John's house um, in his basement in Hackney, London. Uh, It was facilitated by his mom, Sue Barsky Reed. After that, they went on to have offer death cafes in a range of places, including cafes, people's houses, cemeteries, and the Royal Festival Hall. Uh, John and Sue produced a guide to running your own death cafe based around the methodology that Sue developed. It was published in February 2012. The first person to pick it up outside of the UK was Lizzie Miles. I know that my death cafe was the 66th one to ever happen in the world. And it was so cool back then because it was so little. Our tribe was so little. And so I got to talk to John and uh, he was so grateful to help anybody. But yeah, and they, they tried different things. I know the first death cafe, they tried like writing down words and things and burning paper. And (laughs) um, that's how they found out that we didn't need agendas or themes. All we needed to do was say, what brought you here to talk about death and dying? And again, I think that's what makes Death Cafe so special because there's a lot of other death positive movements that are really cool, but they have agendas or things that you do, questions that you ask. And this is the only thing where you don't have that, you know? Yeah, I think it's I think it's wonderful in multiple ways about Death Cafe because you can attend a Death Cafe with no worries that someone is going to try to indoctrinate you or lead you down some path, but you can also host a Death Cafe without having very much knowledge yourself about death and dying because you're not there as an expert or you're not there to teach anyone. You're simply mm-hmm. there to bring people together and encourage them to talk 
talk. So I really love it that it's totally a grassroots movement. And uh, there's something so innocent and I guess honest and pure about it. Right. And, you know, I think for John, John was so passionate about death and dying and uh, bringing the taboo off of death, you know, and he was so, I can't, I mean, he was just so passionate about it. And there's no one else I've ever met in my life who absolutely lived the way that they talked about. John would always say, you know, hug someone like it's the last time you're going to see him. And that's what he did you know, talk to him like it's the last time you're going to talk to him. And he was so caring and compassionate. And I would always tell him, I wish I had his patience and, <laughs> and compassion because he never got upset. He really just lived the way that he talked about. So for him, when he had his first death cafe, you know, I think he had his mom be there because she, you know, was a psychotherapist and a lot of people that host death cafes do have, you know, their social workers or have some clinical experience, but that's not a requirement. All the requirement is that you're excited to talk about death and dying. And then of course, that if someone does come because they think it's a grief counseling session that you do have resources that you could give them if they needed. And I think that's true because Whenever you put out in the public, a group is coming together to talk about death. I think it will attract people who are grieving, even though you say this is not a grief support group or a grief therapy group. I think there will be people grieving who attend. So that's really well. And it's important. absolutely okay if someone comes that's grieving, as long as they're okay to talk about death. And you know, you can't talk about death without talking about life. And of course, grief, you know, grief's going to come up, but it's just not, we're not there to be a grief group, you know? So as long as they're okay with talking about death and dying and aren't there to get support for that, it's okay. Yeah. And, and they're willing to listen to other people's stories too, in a place where they're able to, to listen and hear other people's stories and really have this mutual sharing that takes place. Right. Especially with COVID, you know, how do we not talk about grief? Oh, exactly. I mean, that's been the topic on everyone's minds for the last couple of years. And so mm -hmm. it's actually really essential that we talk about it and that we have places where people can get together to discuss their grief. And, and maybe since you brought it up, we should talk about um, how you're holding death cafes during COVID when, when it isn't always safe for people to come together in person. Yeah. So Jules put out a notice when COVID first hit that we were no longer going to hold um, death cafes in person because of COVID. So we were doing them all online, um, whether it be on Zoom, Google Hangouts, Skype. I even did some on Facebook rooms. And so we did that. Um, we've done that for quite a while. And then people have, some people have went back to face-to-face. -face. You know, I know in San Diego, Karen, man, they had, I can't even tell you how many she had one day back to back to back because they have so many hosts down there. But uh, it's actually been a pretty cool thing because people from all over the world can join in together and talk. So that was a really neat thing. And we, Karen, didn't you used to do um, online death cafes? Yes. Yeah. Back in 2014, I did some virtual online death cafes. They were all, I didn't know anything about Zoom then. So I just used this uh, conference call line. So it was only audio. We couldn't see each other, which was a little weird, but I had pretty good attendance every single month people showed up and new people came every month, just like you experienced. And a few came each time as well. But the conversations were still really rich and wonderful, even though we weren't in the same room together. Yeah, I feel like you were kind of our pioneer with <laughs> online death cafes, honestly, because I don't think that many people had them before. Yeah. And, um, and I tried it because 
because I live up in the mountains in a rural area and there were not enough people where I live to actually have an in-person death cafe and I really wanted to do it. And I thought, well, let's just see what happens if I invite people to come and, you know, come over a conference call. But I found a lot of people that joined my calls would tell me the same thing. Oh, I live in a remote area. Oh, there's yes. a death cafe, but it's 200 miles away. And, and I... I need to talk. So I'm, mm-hmm. I'm showing up here. So I did feel like it, it has a lot of value. Yeah. And that's the thing. I'd have people write me on the Facebook page and say, you know, there's not a death cafe near me. So that did, that did open a lot for them, but you know, people needed to talk and still need to talk with everything going on with COVID. And especially in the very beginning, you know, no one knew what was going on. People were dying at home alone, in the hospital alone. People were being forced to face the mortality every moment. And it wasn't something anyone could hide from anymore, you know? Um, And so where were they going to go to talk about it? So Death Cafe became really important because people needed an outlet, needed someone to talk to. Because it was all, it's all over the TV. It's all over, you know, Facebook. It's all over social media. Um, It was all anybody was talking about. So Death Cafe became very important when COVID started. And I wanted to mention how much Death Cafe has grown in 10 years since it Mm -hmm. first came to the U.S. And perhaps, I don't know this, but perhaps COVID uh, really even accelerated the growth of Death Cafe in the last couple of years. I don't know if that's true or not, but. You know, I think that it's, it still amazes me when people are just finding out what Death Cafe is. And I'm like, oh, you know, (laughs) because it's been around for 10 years now. And people get really excited when they hear about it and find out what it is. And, but yeah, I think it did. It has helped a lot of people, but you know, we've had 13,592 death cafes in over 81 countries now. I saw that on the website, which is incredible. 81 countries and from Afghanistan to Zimbabwe. You know, I know Zimbabwe. Think about that. I mean, yeah, I mean, (laughs) it's crazy. It's incredible because, like we said, this is a grassroots movement. It's mainly been spreading by word of mouth. It hasn't had this huge marketing and promotion campaign to attract people to it. It's word of mouth, and the fact that it's grown that much, I think, is still shows how much we need these opportunities to come together and talk about death. Mm Hmm. You know, I was lucky in 2014, um, Lizzie and I went to Hong Kong and got to help start the first Deaf Cafe in China. And that was the most amazing experience in my life. It was a complete international Deaf Cafe, people from New Zealand, of course, China, Japan, the U.S., Australia. It was part of the International Grief and Bereavement Conference. And, and there was this guy speaking in Cantonese and we had a translator and listening to their views on death was so incredible. It, yeah. It's just amazing. Yeah. It's, it's just incredible to see, but it shows that this, this is a movement that's needed, but that also it strikes a chord in the right way with people. The idea of being able to just come in a group that oftentimes it's a group of strangers, but somehow I think people feel safe there. They aren't worried about, oh no, my family will be there or, or people yes. I work with will be there. It's just strangers and there's some safety in being able to come and talk about whatever it is that you need to say and knowing everyone else came for that same reason. Everyone else is there because they have have a similar need. Right. I think, um, you know, it's such an intimate group and this is something John would always talk about and something I see as well. It's that when you talk about death, you're able to become your true authentic self. You know, you take your mask off and the more you talk about it, the more your authenticity comes out. And, uh, one of the things John said was, I just believe that You know, the more people talk about death, the less bullshit there would be. (laughs) But it's it's true. You know, if you're talking about and focusing on death and things that matter and like one of the 
uh, major themes that come up in my death cafes are relationships, you know, and like what people want their legacies to be to their children or deaths that they've encountered in their life and things that they witnessed and things that they don't want to happen to them or their children. It puts a lot of things in perspective and makes you realize what's trivial in life, you know? The more people come to death cafes and have these conversations, it really makes them focus on life more. And and that's one of the number one things that shows up on my um, evaluations is, and a lot of death cafes host evaluations is that, you know, my views on death didn't change, but my views on life changed. Mm. Um, and that's always been such an amazing thing to me to hear that. Yeah. And I I just think of how transformative that is for people in general, but also for a community. I, I, you know, I would love to see statistics on what happens in a community where there's a death cafe like St. Joseph, where you live, where people are openly talking about death cafe, where there are probably flyers hanging on bulletin boards somewhere, Mm -hmm. or it's in the newspaper, death cafe, just the word death and just bringing it to people's awareness. And the fact that they know there's something like death cafe, even if they've never attended, I just think it really helps people wake up a bit about death and perhaps become more accepting just knowing that there's this group of people that gets together and talks about death. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to, to make sure we mentioned that this, the, the family of people involved in death cafe went through a grief process of their own in 2017 when John Underwood died. And very suddenly, it was such a shock to everyone. And so I, I don't know if, if you could talk a little bit like what happened in the Death Cafe movement after John's death, because sometimes when the founder of a movement dies, the movement also dies. But that hasn't happened at all with Death Cafe. No, not at all. And um they weren't going to let that happen because it's it was so important to John and so important to his family. And, um, you know, it was very hard when John died um, on, I think, everyone in the Death Cafe community and people that didn't even know him were really affected by his death. Donna, his wife, she started running the Twitter page for him because John did the Twitter page. Um, and Donna's done a wonderful job at it. Jules, his sister, she has picked up a lot of what John did. Um, she's answered all the emails and done kind of the behind the scenes work that John did that a lot of people just weren't privy to. <laughs> and then his mom has done a lot of the other work that a lot of people just didn't know about. There's a lot of work that we all do that people don't really see. But I think it was, you know, it was definitely really hard on his mom and Donna and, of course, Jules. So, you know, and I tried to help as much as I could during all of it, and it was very hard on me as well. It was just so sudden. Nobody was expecting that at all. But, you know, I guess John died the way he lived. You know, he, I I don't think his family would mind me sharing this. Um, When he died he was giving his daughter a really long hug. And that's what he would always say is give someone a hug like it's the last time hugging them. Mm -hmm. And that's what he was doing. Wow. And um, I don't know, that's just, that makes me happy, you know, that that's what he was doing. And in a way, John was really preparing everyone he, he came in contact with just by his awareness of death and his attitudes and his wisdom about death he it seems like in everything he did he was helping people be prepared for absolutely for grief and for loss knowing that it will happen in all of our lives at some point or another and Mm so wow that's an amazing legacy there that he left for everyone that we can just turn back to things that he said and wrote and then this movement that he created and really find comfort there, especially knowing that it has carried on and it continues to grow even after his death. Yes. And like uh, one of the things that he really helped me with was impermanence. 
he taught me a lot about impermanence and uh, that helped me a lot. I'm trying to find this quote that they found in his journal and I made it into a meme. It's something like time matters when you know you are dying. But yeah, I mean, on, I can honestly say that there is no one in my life I've ever met like John who literally lived like he preached. Not that he preached, but like he uh, taught. John and I used to meet every week on Skype to go over things. And he just had this calming presence. And uh, yeah, there was no one else like him. And, you know, I still grieve over John and I think a lot of people do. And mm -hmm. um, we have our Death Cafe host page. Facebook page, like a group that everybody talked on. And then of course the Facebook page that I run, um, a lot of people, I post stuff and ask people to write memories and a lot of people did. So there was a lot of outlets for people to write and share their grief. Um, but I think, you know, we, we keep his memory alive by hosting death cafes and we talk about the history of death cafe. And, you know, just, I'm just thinking of all the lives that, John touched in person, for one thing, by sharing his wisdom and his presence with the people that knew him personally. But then there are hundreds of thousands of other people who've attended death cafes who were touched by John's work without ever meeting him. Right. Right. And um, I don't know if you saw the videos that came out for our 10-year anniversary with John. They were posted on um, Facebook page, on Instagram, and on Twitter. They're really cool. And they're of John. Oh, I have to look at those. And I'll leave a link for those in the show notes for this episode in case people listening want to see those as well. Yeah, John was an amazing guy. Yeah. Well, Megan, it seems to me that as many death cafes have been held in the last 10 years, we need many more death cafes. I feel like we could use them everywhere in, in every community. I can't imagine a place that, that it wouldn't be beneficial or helpful to people. Right. I agree with you. And so one thing that I would like to encourage if people are listening is to consider, could you host a death cafe in your community because it's not like it, you don't have to make a commitment of doing one every month or something. You can do a one, one death cafe and that alone can be really helpful for your community. Mm -hmm. And, and I just want to, I want to encourage people to think about it because in some ways it's probably easier than people might think to do a death cafe. And so tell us, I know on the Death Cafe website, there are a lot of resources there. At least that's what I found, like a lot of help for how to do a Death Cafe. Yeah. So we have guidelines that teach you how to have your own um, Death Cafe. We have an introduction working with us. What do I need to, to do to hold a Death Cafe? You know, it's pretty simple, straightforward. Just somebody who is excited to talk about death and bring death conversations in the community and you know you got to find a venue um, if you're going to have it in person you know I have always had mine at like a little cafe shop you could have it at a library a funeral home finding a place setting a date and then getting the word out and we do ask that people you know read our guidelines on deathcafe.com agree to those and then you know start your own profile on deathcafe.com and do a write up afterwards and you can advertise on deathcafe.com uh, but if you want to do one on zoom right now like a lot of people are that makes it easy um if you're familiar with zoom and then that way you can have people coming from all over and you can limit it to 10 people or however many you want to um, but if you need help you know, we do have death cafe facilitators who are more than happy to help you get started. You can message me on the death cafe Facebook page and I can uh, get you connected with somebody. Oh, I wanted to ask you, you mentioned the number of participants. Do you find that it's best to have some sort of limit on the number of people in order to have the, the best experience with conversations? Well, we ask that you have one facilitator per 10 people. 
So if you're going to have 20 people, you have two facilitators. If you have 30, you have have three, that type of thing. Mm -hmm. Um, I usually limit mine to like 20, 25, but that's because that's how many people would hold in my space that I have. Now, if I'm doing it on Zoom, then I don't want to break out into Zoom rooms because that just gets too messy for me. Yeah. Um, But I have another facilitator with me and we usually have about 15 people. So it really is just up to you. Now, I know in Atlanta, they have a big cemetery they do it in. I think they have like maybe 45, 50 people and they'll have like four facilitators. So it just... You want to make sure you have enough facilitators per people because the facilitators help go around and make sure that everybody's staying on topic, making sure that like nobody's trying to lead anyone to any conclusion about death, you know, or anything like that. Um, Which honestly, in 10 years, I think I've only heard of one, maybe two death cafes that anything like that has happened at. My very first death cafe, I had a table of five women. Every single one of them was of a different religion, and they all shared that with each other. And they were all laughing, having a great time, and shared their numbers with each other. It's usually not a big deal at all. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, there's something about the format that... It just, it really invites people to just share really openly and honestly. And to, as you were saying before, to set aside any kind of pretense or any kind of personal agenda they might have and just be real and open with everyone else. Right. And I think it is something about being strangers, you know, um, that just allows you to be more authentic. I always ask at the end of my death death phase, like, what was your aha moment tonight, you know? And it's so interesting to hear what people have to say. You know, the one big thing that comes up is that people always say that they enjoy coming there because they're able to talk in a non-judgmental way. And I know for one person, they told me they grew up Baptist and they were so used to, if they talked about death or religion or anything like that, they were felt like they were judged. Mm -hmm. And so for them, it was such a new idea to come into space and it not be feel judgmental. Um, so I think death cafe really is such a new idea for so many people because they grew up in such a different atmosphere and time. And it's still a really unique experience just because of the fact that it's not for profit. There's no charge to attend and there's no one trying to sell anything. <laughs> you know, there's, right. there's no one trying to, trying to get something out of the participants, which is a huge relief because we've all mm-hmm. been to, we've all been to events where someone <laughs> had a hidden agenda of wanting us right. to buy something from them. And so it just really invites people to feel safe and to share whatever is on their mind and their heart that they need to talk about. Right. And that was the big thing for John was, you know, he did not want this to be anything that made money. It's a service that we're doing for people to help them. I think that's another reason why I just fell in love with Death Cafe too. You know, it helps people and there is no hidden agenda. You know, there's no themes. There's nothing that's trying to come out and get you. It's the open format. But yeah, to be in 81 countries speaks a lot for itself. Yeah, it's it's amazing. Well, you, you were mentioning that a cemetery or funeral home could host a death cafe, maybe even a hospice or even a long-term care facility could host one. But do you think it puts a damper on it if, say, if a funeral home held a death cafe? Do you think there are people who might not come just because of where it's located? So... <laughs> We've had this debate before. Um, there are some people that, like, if it was me and I just was little old me and had one hosted it at a funeral home, right? It still might be an off foot because people are like, oh, I'm coming to a funeral home, like, and there's funerals, right? But then an actual funeral home itself having one might be an off foot because they're like, is there a hidden agenda behind this? You mm-hmm. know? And then hospice, is there a hidden agenda behind this? And sometimes, honestly, there could be a hidden agenda behind it. We don't know, you know, but I like to look at it as they're doing a service, you know, what are, then it's like, is it a, um, 
community outreach thing, you know, Mm -hmm. but I feel like as long as they don't have marketing tools out, it's fine, you know? And so that's something I know Lizzie and I have dealt with for a long time. We've talked to hospices that wanted to have them and we've said, as long as you don't have marketing things out, you know, it's fine to host one. But if you're trying to do this as a marketing event, then no, it's not okay. Yeah, one thing occurs to me is if a hospice or funeral home wanted to donate space for a death cafe to meet, maybe they could invite in a a host from outside their organization. Someone else comes and hosts it. So they're only donating space and they're not controlling anything else about the event. You know, Mark in Atlanta, he has his at a cemetery and he has a very cool layout. It's not connected to a funeral home. Megan, several years ago, I was doing some kind of continuing education talk at a hospital for the nursing staff of the hospital. And I was telling them about some of the new things around end of life that that are out there in the community. And I mentioned Death Cafe and told them what it was like and what it was about. And when I was done speaking, three nurses came up to me and all three of them were like teary eyed. And all of them said, we need a death cafe. Could you please have a death cafe for us? And that was in a community where I didn't live. So there was no way I could do that. I tried to plant that idea in someone else's mind to do a death cafe. I don't know if that's been done. If, if it, is it possible to do a death cafe that's limited, that only reaches out, say, to the employees of one hospital? Yeah. So I got asked to do one for this huge life insurance company. And this was in the very beginning. And I reached out to John and uh, he was like, yeah, go for it. And it was like a thousand people. Wow. And so I had to take a lot of co-facilitators with me. It was in Iowa, which was like three hours away from me. It was one of the best death cafes I've ever had. So they had a before I die wall there. And we got to take part in that. So we started the death cafe and we do it. So this lady, it was the most amazing thing I'd ever seen. So this lady had um, been off of work. Her son had committed suicide and she gave me permission to tell a story. And she had not talked about this at all to anyone, but she started talking about it in a group. And when I did, what was your aha moment? At the very end, she got up in front of a thousand people and said this. She said, you know, every day I come here and you guys ask me, hey, how are you doing? She goes, and you just want me to say I'm okay. She goes, and I'm not okay. And she just went on and told them how she was not okay. You know, her son committed suicide and she was really sad and really depressed. And she didn't want them, say, you know, to ask for that just because they wanted her to say she was okay. You know, and it was, it was a huge moment, you know. Wow. And um, everybody in the room was just kind of like taken back. But then they all went up to her and talked to her. And I was just like, wow, this is a big deal, you know? And that was probably my fourth death cafe I ever did. But I thought that was a huge moment, you know, for this lady and for me to see this being done. My actual first death cafe was for hospice, for the hospice I was working in collaboration with. It's kind of a test run, but I did it um, with them, and it was really interesting. They talked about contradictions they had in themselves, lots of stuff. But yeah, I, it can be done just for, you know, John always said that if you were going to have a death cafe for just a certain group, they it was because they needed it. Yeah, especially yeah when it's a group that's kind of been underserved and maybe unrecognized in the past and that other things that are offered don't meet the needs of that group. It seems like Death Cafe is one thing that's very flexible. So the model works really well for lots of different groups of people. Mm-hmm. Well, and you know, for hospice workers, they don't really have a place to talk about death besides, I mean, they talk about death all day long, right? But like, and they have IDG, but where do they really get to get together and talk about process their feelings about death? Yeah, that's so true. I mean, especially their deep inner feelings, their personal feelings. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. So that is what's cool about Death Cafe is that it is flexible in that way, but it just continues to grow. And um, I'm so glad that I've been a part of it. Yeah, I have loved it. I've loved every experience I've had with Death Cafe. I've been a participant several times and I've hosted a few in-person ones and then the virtual Death Cafes. And it's, it's actually been the most amazing thing I think I've ever participated in around death and dying. For I think what's incredible is just seeing the stories that people come up with and tell and uh, mm-hmm. how moving it is. Oh, I remember one one facilitator told me about having a lot of first responders, like EMTs, even uh, law enforcement officers who Mm -hmm. deal with death, who, you know, who who deal with death in their line of work and never have anyone to talk about it because it's confidential. They can't tell anyone what they experienced. And I guess this is true for medical personnel, too. They go home at night and they're carrying all of this trauma over what they've witnessed and seen and all these questions in their mind about death and why things happen. And there's no one to talk to about it at all. So again, it's just like, it's such an amazing service to offer to all kinds of people, a a vast array of people out there in the community who really have a deep seated need to talk about death and dying. Right. And you know, that turns into trauma when we can't talk about it. And when we're seeing it everywhere, you know, it really is a huge service. And I always ask on the Death Cafe Facebook page, I'll ask once a week, um, what's on your mind as it relates to death and dying? And the answers that I get are just amazing. And people will respond to each other. You know, they have like many Death Cafes on the Facebook page. It's so incredible. And when COVID was like hitting really hard, it was just so sad to see the comments. But yeah, it's it's kind of cool on the Facebook page because people will just connect with each other and talk. And um, I do have secret Facebook groups for people on the Facebook page so that they can talk and no one can see what's going on. So if anyone wants to be a part of that, they can just write me on the page. So it sounds like if someone listening is interested maybe in starting a death cafe, and I hope, I hope so. That was the intent of this conversation (laughs) to get people out there saying, wow, I would like to do that. They could go to the Facebook page, which I'll leave a link to that, but that's maybe a good place to start to kind of see what the conversations are like or what's happening there. But then also, should they go to the website for death cafe? Yeah, they should go to deathcafe.com and read, um, how to start your own death cafe really is where they should start first. And do you recommend that people who are brand new to death cafe attend one first, like maybe attend a virtual death cafe before they try to lead their own? Yeah, I'd say um, attend one first and see what it's like. And I always tell people this, if you attend a death cafe and there's an agenda or a theme that is not a real death cafe and let us know. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, it's so important because that that is definitely one of the keys to Death Cafe being being successful and being helpful to people is being free of the agenda. So, right, because we don't ever want that happening and people thinking that's what it is, and because that's and then, the beauty of Death Cafe. How do people find out if there's a Death Cafe taking place near them or where a virtual Death Cafe might be? So they just go to deathcafe.com and you can search for death cafes in your area. Yeah, when you're on deathcafe.com, the third one over says find a death cafe. So you can go to forthcoming death cafes and then you can put in like your zip code and search. And you can look like just down through what's going on. But if you go to home, it will show you all like the virtual ones and you can just click on those and find a virtual one that you would like to go to. Like right now I'm on there and there's one coming up January 20th and it gives a Zoom link and it's from 6 to 7.30 Mountain Time. There's another one January 22nd. So, I mean, you can find any of them right there on the first page. 
All right. And the really the virtual death cafes are so simple. You just show up and attend and you don't have to say anything. You can attend and listen to other people if you're shy right. about talking or not ready to talk yet. Yeah. I mean, at the last death cafe I had, I had someone who didn't talk the whole time, just listened. Whatever you want to do, you know? Yeah, for sure. And there are so many listed right now. Yeah, I, I was noticing, I mean, all over the world, I was seeing some in different languages, po- you know, postings, and it's amazing. You know, and not only that, but we have, if you go up, you can look and you can see death conversation. You know, if you want to post something that you wrote about death or a poem or just a link to something you like, you can do that. That's what makes deathcafe.com really cool. There's a lot of really neat things on there blog post. There's a lot of neat things on there. And John posted some really cool stuff on there. And I will say, Megan, some of the best people I've ever met in the end of life movement are part of Death Cafe. Like that has been the best networking I've ever done and the best Mm -hmm. opportunity for connecting with people. I know it has been for me too. And it's so funny because I've always thought of you as Death Cafe (laughs) because I've always thought of you as like the pioneer of the virtual Death Cafe. (laughs) Well, I mean, I did it without, without really knowing what I was doing in terms of like like how to do it technically (laughs) very well, but, uh, but I loved it. I did it once a month for, I think almost three years. Yeah, I know. Cause I would have people that would be like, that didn't have anywhere to go. And I would be like, Oh, get here, get a hold of Karen Wyatt. (laughs) Well, I hope what I put forth there inspired other people (laughs) maybe led the way for virtual death cafes during COVID. So absolutely, you know, and It's right now, I don't know where you're at, but where I'm at in Missouri, it's like worse than it was before with COVID. So virtual is the way to go for a while. (laughs) Right. But what I always tell people is you're virtual, but you want to remind people to have cake and coffee or tea with them. Ah, yes. That's important. That's right. I love that philosophy too. But I think that's that's nice because it's remembering that there's sweetness in life and death and that mm-hmm. that it isn't something that should be sad and without pleasure at all. Like it's, it's okay to come together and eat something delicious. And so Yeah. And you know, I don't know about you, but most of the death cafes I've ever had, it's laughter. You know, there are sometimes mm-hmm. tears, but there's laughter. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Well, I'm hoping, Megan, that we're inspiring all kinds of people out there to start a death cafe. It's so much easier than you might imagine. And people come. That's the amazing thing. If you, you put the word out that you're doing this and people will show up. Mm-hmm. I've, I've never seen it fail. I've never heard of anyone who had a death cafe and not one single person came. Like right. people will come. The right people will come who really need to be there. So I hope we've inspired inspired someone to start a death cafe and uh, that they feel empowered now to go out and do that. Me too. So I'm, I'll remind everyone, I'm talking to Megan Mooney and she's the host of the International Death Cafe Facebook page and of the St. Joseph, Missouri Death Cafe. And uh, Megan, I, I really appreciate this work you've been doing. You've been a faithful member of Death Cafe for such a long time. And I'm really grateful to you for sticking with it all these years. Thank you, Karen. So one more time, we'll just remind people to go to deathcafe.com and you can find everything you need there to get started with the Death Cafe. And I hope you'll do that. And Megan, thank you so much for spending an hour with me today. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Yes, it's really fun to talk with you. You too. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Megan about Death Cafe and really how exciting this movement is and how much it has grown over the years. So if you know all about Death Cafe, maybe you've even hosted a Death Cafe, um, give yourself a pat on the back for having done that because I think it's a really important way to move forward 
conversations and awareness about end of life issues. And again, as I said several times, consider hosting your own death cafe, even if you've held one in the past, maybe it's time to do it again. And the virtual space is wide open. It's actually a great way to connect with people in your own community and in other places. So keep that in mind as well. So I want to remind you, if you like this kind of content and you enjoy listening to the podcast, be sure to tell other people about it. You can share an individual episode or actually show them how to subscribe and start listening if you think it might benefit them. It's also helpful if you subscribe or follow on whatever platform you happen to use to listen to podcasts. And if you leave a five star rating and review, if that's sincere, if you do like the podcast, because that makes it easier for other people to find this podcast when they're searching for information about the end of life. I appreciate you all for doing that. So thank you very much. And I'll be back next Monday with another interview for you. So until then, remember that we're here for love. So face your fear, be ready for whatever life brings you next, and love each and every moment of your beautiful life. Bye-bye.